Welcome to Let's Talk Possibility. Tonight we're talking with Conan Marion from Bochabello Michalisburg about how resilience can get you through adversity. And welcome to Let's Talk Possibility. I'm very happy to be here and with our special guests, um, Khan and Marion, who have come all the way from Michalisburg, which is, for those that are listening who don't know, that's a couple of hours' drive from, from where we are here in Centurion. One hour. One hour drive. One hour drive. Yes. <laughs> yeah, in studio with me is Jack. Hi, guys. Welcome. He's back from Cape Town. We had him on yes. Skype last time. <laughs> yeah, that was an interesting experience. It was. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We're well, cool to have you here. And Tim, our producer. How's it, Tim? Yeah, so tonight we, we want to talk about persistence and really how people actually persist in the face of huge challenges. What gets them to get up every day and carry on and, and not give up? Mm. And I think yeah, it was last week, last week you and I went to, to visit mm. Bochabello in Hallisburg, the, the orphanage. Yeah, we... Um, we zooted out there. Yeah, I mean, um, Conor Mary and you guys are dealing with uh, quite a bunch of kids there it's quite a large organization you guys have built up there we went to go visit them last week um because delano it was the first time to go there and kind of get a feel for what it's yeah. about um and, and i remember sorry can you saying like if you want your life changed you gotta go and I'm, i can be go if you go visit bocciabello <laughs> <laughs> because sure i um, just hearing the stories and the challenges and I mean, while we were there, we experienced challenges. There was a fault fire, and we yeah. all went running out um, with all the kids and breaking up branches of trees and beating out this, this fire. So for, for a context of facing challenges, um, your story is just phenomenal, and you're doing amazing work there. So I know you have, like, about 200 Thanks. kids that, that live in, in the orphanage with you. Yes. Well, firstly, it's not an orphanage. Yes. Uh, Tell you us. Don't, you, don't have, us. A, you don't really have orphanages, but we're really a poverty alleviation organization. So a lot of we go into partnership with parents. We we um, work with welfare, but we don't believe that it is a healthy way to grow without your lineage, mm. especially in Africa and mm. the way the lineages work. Mm. So we go into partnership with parents and help them um, oh, to okay. fill into the, the fill in those places where they just cannot provide. Mm. So if you're not eating and um, you're facing starvation on a daily basis and other kinds of social abuse because of poverty, you don't have the time to really have that aesthetic um, space for your child. Yeah. And that's where we go in and uh, help the family. Yeah. And yes, a lot of them um, sleep in, in our main home because it's not safe at home yeah. for many reasons. Can you mention the... Um uh, it kind of latches on to what Marion just said. You mentioned last time we were there last Saturday, you get a, a bunch of types of or orphans. Um, yes, yes. Could you um, kind of elaborate on that? Absolutely. You first get the, the dictionary uh, definition of an orphan, mm. which is with no surviving relatives. Yes. Then you get the alcoholic orphan, yeah. where out in the rural areas particularly, you find single parent scenarios, which is very prevalent. In fact, it's the majority. Mm -hmm. um, where things are just so dismal and bleak for the single parent, which is normally the mother, that they lean into alcohol. So you have alcohol syndrome children that are born from that. You have children who are born who start looking after the mother's next newborns from the age of three, four. Um, the mother's trying to survive herself so she leans into alcohol mm. and there's just no parenting yeah so families have been totally shattered you have extended families or friends normally looking after children mm. um and then of course you have economically challenged people okay. where they can't afford to look after their own yeah. children yeah. so that's an economically challenged orphan yeah and those are the three main ones that i would pick up on yeah Yes, and some children who just walk away from their homes because they know it's not safe. Okay. And a lot of parents don't want to. We still have a very European-based welfare system where you either have the child or you don't. Mm. It's, it's, it, there's no gray area. And uh, child-rearing and parenting and poverty is very gray. Mm. Mm. 
and you have to make space for the gray areas. And we find that the reason we've never had a suicide in 21 years, never wow. had a suicide and never had a teenage pregnancy, is because we went into the gray area. Okay. And we allowed the children to make decisions about their lives. Wow. And they now, well, we've seen the results. It's not an experiment. Yeah. Um, yeah. We, children that slept um, in our bedroom as babies are now 20 year olds. Wow. And, um, and they're wonderful, wonderful, proud African citizens mm -hmm. who are proud of their culture and excited to go into the future. Awesome. Now, you guys, you guys of Quite A Street yourselves, um, Con, I know you were quite a businessman. Um, and you were a teacher, as far as I understand. Yeah, I, I was studying. You were studying as a teacher. <laughs> I would like to stay <laughs> at Wits University for the rest of my life. Oh, okay. <laughs> to do research. <laughs> and do research. <laughs> but you guys had, had um, what we would probably call, um, I don't know if you would call it affluent, but you had quite a very nice lifestyle very in terms of the... A comfortable lifestyle in terms yeah. of the house, in terms of the cars, in terms of the holidays, boats, holidays that kind of stuff. Um, but you guys made quite a shift in terms of that and to where you guys are now. What was your reason for pursuing what you guys are pursuing now? And what made, made you make that decision to, to go in there and, 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 and make this change and, and pursue this? You answer that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I kind of gave him an up to. Uh, I, well, I came to him, and I wouldn't be that rude, but I just came to him and said, listen, I, I, I had just really done well in some IT nonsense where I was working in corporate. Mm. And I said to him, you know, I've got everything, we've got everything, and we're really going up, you know? Yeah. The, a parent's dream, go to varsity, get your things, now start accumulating. And I said, I, I just, I'm not doing it again this lifetime. I am just not. Yeah. I'm tired of this, and, and we've got to share. And really, in the system that is out there, you don't share. And our yeah. parents taught us, keep everything to yourself. And the famous, terrible words, charity starts at home. Yeah. It doesn't. Charity starts in the world. Okay. And, um, that's, and that's why I, I asked if he could just give up, which was hard for him, mm. because he was um, upper middle, mm. and I was middle down to labor. So I... You know, I just, I just couldn't see myself doing, spending all our precious time for a house. Mm. And what were we going to teach our children? Mm. And I didn't like what our children were learning. Okay. So um, I asked him and he said yes. And I had no idea what I was doing really. <laughs> when, in retrospect, I don't know if I would have been brave enough to go through the horrors that we did. Yeah. But it was the pleasure and the love. We found a different currency. Mm. Okay. We found a human currency. Well, I think we learned the art of living. Yes. Yeah. Truly living. Because we experience all the emotions possible on a daily basis. Mm. I experience them in that few hours <laughs> <laughs> and the next day <laughs> and the night. Yeah. We yeah. took our children yes. from a private school in, um, in Santon and took them to this place. And, and what I love about children, that's why they are future. Yeah. And, and my daughters, uh, our daughters just walked on to the village, looked at everybody and said, hi, what have you been doing all your life? And here were these underprivileged, traumatized kids, and they all looked at each other, and I realized that there wasn't a distance mm. other than what we make. Mm. Um, so, and when they matriculated, they decided to join us, which we thought was a huge thing. We didn't expect them to. Mm. Okay. We got offers from my brother to just go and do the next generation thing. Go and live in privilege, work in companies, go to varsity. Mm. And I was really um, taken aback. We were really we were amazed at when they turned around and said, we are going to, there are not enough people doing this. Okay. Wow. And, and just so to make it so what you did is you, you bought this piece of land out in Kalisburg in a very rural area, mm -hmm. and that's where you've now built this community. Yeah. So and the whole community has actually just sprung up from addressing the critical needs of the community, mm. not, not even your basic needs, just the critical needs. Cool. Mm. And today we have a complete poverty alleviation village mm. with our own schools, our own clinic, our own accommodation. Mm. Um, what he's saying is that we never planned it. <laughs> yeah. Definitely um, not. It, it, the, the planning was dynamic. It happened as it happened. Yeah. When someone died, we found a coffin. Mm. Then we got the coffin, we had to find a hole. Mm. 
And that's really how it went from step to step. And that's why it is so real. Nothing was ever planned academically. So everything I learned in anthropology and sociology and psych, I haven't used yet. But oh. I'm sure I will one day um, if I write a book. Yeah. But when I'm dealing with people and meeting people who've uh, got a grade one and they are my age yeah. and they teach me a lot about life, then you know that um, that's what happens in balance. Yeah. And that comes back to the resilience that you're speaking about. Yeah. What has made us continue? Yeah. And the only reason I think we continued eventually, I'm not sure how we continued in the beginning. I, it was just such a shock to us, a shock. Um, it also made it very obvious what had been going on during apartheid. Yeah. Nothing even um, when I was at WITS prepared me for just the horrors of what had happened in our country and how um, we had been hidden it had been hidden mm. from us yeah. to meet people that um, and families that have been destroyed. And I think then we realized just how big it is. And even today, people don't believe it. Yeah. That we are an hour out of Johannesburg, an hour in, from Joburg, an hour into poverty. Yeah. And it's still hidden. Michalisburg is the most beautiful area. It is. Mm. Stunning. Um, but what happened there is is something still to be told. Yeah. We were discussing it as we were driving home last week. Um, I've been seen to see you guys a few times, but I think that specific visit for some reason made me realize a bunch of stuff. Um, but and specifically the references that we were talking about and the references that we have and then our viewpoint of life here in the city as such and in cultured society versus, like you just said, an hour away is so, so different. different. And the understanding of that, I think, is the key point and probably the hardest point in terms of bringing those two together. Because our references are so different. You know, if I'm walking around with a map of London and I'm walking around in New York, that's kind of the same thing. You know, yeah. it's not, it's not going to work. Um, so I think that was one of the things that kind of stood out for me, and, and yeah, is yeah, it's, it's, it's the challenges you guys deal with every day is is bringing those two worlds together. And we live yeah. in a different world. Yeah, actually, we we would get on with people. I found when I went overseas, the people that I could really mix with were the poorest. Okay. Because we spoke the same language. Mm. It's we don't speak the same language. Mm. We we are not. We just not seen. It's all the children that have fallen between the cracks. Yeah. No one cares about them. And still now, we don't have access to justice. We don't have access to law. And we don't have ex access to education. They say we do, we don't. Because the education that kids are getting in these um, schools here is not what we're getting. Mm. So those mm. are the kind of challenges you guys are facing, um, my understanding anyway. You guys basically... <laughs> You guys are dealing with the on the ground. It doesn't get much more real than what you guys are dealing with. You're dealing with the government systems. You're dealing with the school systems. You're dealing with AIDS. You're dealing with orphans. You're dealing with, with all these things out there that people know about, but they don't really understand. Yeah. But you guys deal with that every day throughout and, the day. And we just had all the emotions that are attached to that because yeah. it well, I think it comes back to your points of reference where I think if you're poor you don't have points of reference because nobody in the family has been educated enough to be able to build up that framework yeah. mm -hmm. whereas the points of reference that we live by are just that they are points of reference for us because what we've done is we've tried to take we, we haven't tried, we have successfully taken our points of reference and juxtaposed them at that level and those are the bridges we are using to try and build up the community mm. and to try and bring opportunities to people who under normal circumstances would never have access to those opportunities. And we've got to be so careful not to be patronizing. Mm. Absolutely. Because we take our backgrounds so for granted. Yeah. yeah. So you have to be careful that you respect. And that's why we say we don't do anything. People come and say, you've done amazing things. We say, no, we haven't. Sorry, we, we facilitate. Yeah. That's all we do. Mm. We facilitate. And what we have discovered, everybody knows what they want to do with okay. their lives. Oh, really? 
from the youngest child they know. Yeah. That's why I always ask them. You know, parents come and say, please take my child and help us. We're starving. I say, mm -mm. you want help, ask me. Your child wants help, child asks me. Okay. And if the child says, I don't want to be here, I say, it was nice knowing you. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody must journey on their mm. journey. Yeah. So we really just don't, and some people say to me, we, uh, I had a baby, and he was just uh, four months, mother was um, dying, and uh, she came back. She asked us to help with the child, and she came back, and she was so drunk she couldn't stand. She said, she's come back to fetch your child. So I took that baby and gave it to her, and she almost fell over. And she looked down at this baby and said, of course, everybody was just freaking out, saying, we're going to kill the baby. Oh, yeah. oh when the ice cold, because, yes. I mean, this, mm -hmm. is, this is a nightmare coming and to I, yeah. She just took the baby, she looked at it, and in that moment of, of, in that fog of poverty, and I just could see what's happened to her life as a woman broken down. Mm. She took the child and said, no, I need you to help me with the child. And I said, now you've got it. Mm. Mm. It's not about ownership. You don't own children. Children yeah. are owned by everybody. Okay. All children belong to all of us. We have to make sure because they're the future generation. Yeah. Yeah. But the resilience, and people ask, how can we get involved? What can we do? It's so little. And I always tell people, if you're in this huge felt in the middle of the night, and you, and you light a candle, you can see that light. Yeah. From far. We never see how much we have done or what we could have done because we would, we would not be able to maintain our sanity. Yeah. We just look at each day and say that was a successful day. Okay. We can't plan, we don't have money to plan. But we, we, we have human currency and we have to be careful how you use it. Mm. Because you can take 10 rand and blow it. You cannot take 10 units of humanness and blow it. Yeah. You pay for it for the rest of your life. Okay. So we've really become aware of every moment of being a human. Now, you guys, obviously, it takes a lot to keep this place running. And one of the f challenges, obviously, like you just said, is obviously a financial challenge. Um, to run a school, a village of that magnitude takes a lot of cash, um, and it takes a lot of effort from everybody. You guys have man management structures to keep the place running, as far as I understand. In terms of actual... Um, support financial support how do you guys run that and where does that come from because that's obviously one of the big challenges you guys are facing right <laughs> go for it well i mean we do have the norwegians that help us with food every month okay. money and um, this is the um, leiderhorn choir from bergen i mean if it wasn't for them we would have a lot of kids would have just died mm. literally died really? not even nearly they would have died yeah um, but, you know, uh, we work in a way that other people would never budget and survive it. Mm. We have a certain amount of money that we get in from the Norwegians, and the rest is the goodness of other people. Okay. So we know that, and, and, and the youth are amazing. And we don't just help youth and children, we help um, elderly mm. and ill. A lot of people can't work anymore, and the minute they can't work, they lose their jobs, and they're dying mm. of AIDS. But that's a long time before they die. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we take them in and um, into the family and make them feel okay about dying. We have yeah. to prepare them to be okay about dying yeah. and saying goodbye to their children and teaching the children to say goodbye to parents. Wow. But we, we know that somehow, I don't know, we just have these angels coming out of nowhere and just helping us survive. Yeah. We'll, um, we'll have the last cent and we'll have no gas. Like at the moment, we've got no gas. <laughs> and we're using all kinds of ways to cook. But um, the family pulls in and they know that there's something greater. Um, and, and I think it's that very strange, elusive world called love. Mm. We have a love amongst ourselves and respect for each other's pain that comes up all the time. So people uh, send us money. Sometimes people send us 20 rand. And it's just that time that Nicole, my daughter, needs 20 rand to put in the car to get to the clinic. Yeah. So of course we can't really go on holidays, unfortunately. But, but um, our, our main, and we've got some children in jail. 
okay. um, that we have to visit each week. And so those are the visits, the hospital visits and the jail visits that are most important at the moment. And people help. Mm. Mm. 30 rand, you know, you could put in petrol. Mm. So it's the little so things that count. And it's, you know, people come along and say, I can't give you anything. I can give you a blessing. And we say, it's wonderful. I mean, that's the, the etheric part of it where mm. we are, um, uh, we're a human village. Yes. And a lot of people say that um, they can never do what we do. Oh, definitely you can. I've not met anyone that I don't think can do what we can do. Really? Um, we just um, decided to take responsibility for being a human being. It's hard to take responsibility. Mm. I, I would really prefer to have a boss. I'd like a boss. Yeah. But I've got a far bigger boss. And I've got to work. And I've got to take responsibility. I don't want to go to a child and tell them their parents are dying. Yeah. I've had to sit with children while the parent is dying and doesn't want to take medicine. And I say, oh, please, just let anyone, can the world just swallow me, anyone? I want to disappear. <laughs> or when a baby's been born and I'm worried that that baby's not going to make it and I've got to catch that baby, mm. which I've delivered lots and lots of babies. They're already running around the village yeah. in grade five and six and delivered a baby that died. And to be able to take it and hold it in front of the children and say, let it go. Yeah. So we've mm -hmm. learned to let go and we've learned to take in. So we really, we breathe in and we breathe out. Yeah. So it sounds like one of the main resources then that you pull on in order to, to keep going is that breathe in, breathe out, deal yeah. with this moment now. Yeah. Kind of a, a, a sense of where you need to get to. Like, you know, we Actually, need to... we're not going anywhere. No, it's I mean, that, like that a vision that... moment, that, that moment, to take a moment like brushing your teeth and making that moment about that yeah. mm. and not planning in the future. Mm. So we'll take the death moment. And for me, being a really strange experience is when everybody around us dies from AIDS normally. But to lose one of our sons from a car accident, just a ridiculous car accident, and have to sleep next to his body all night, that's how it's done. Yeah. Another moment where I thought, oh, please let something happen, like an earthquake? <laughs> or like, yeah. could there be a disaster declared? Please. But just, to take yeah. that pain and hold it and stay in pain is quite an experience. Mm. And women can hold pain. Okay. Men run a lot away <laughs> from it. <laughs> that women can hold pain. Wow. And, and I see that's what makes us so very, very special. I think that's why we deliver babies. I think men organize life around the pain. Yes, they do. Mm, yeah, we, we not. And our men, and we realize that the men <coughs> hold that space for us. They hold a very huge space, the few we've got. Okay. <coughs> yeah. so uh, just on the, sorry, on yes. the lighter side, you know, it's not all death and gloom. <laughs> there, there are some hilarious stories that come out of it. Like yes. when Gabby was born and... <laughs> One of the guys from emergency services is collecting poisonous snakes because he wants to start educating the public on poisonous snakes and yeah, milking them. To build them their bank. To build their bank. The serum. Oh, and yes, okay. what happened was on that particular day we had caught a puff adder. Marion and Lee had caught a puff adder. Okay. And emergency services had to come and pick up the mother and the newborn child. Which we delivered during volleyball. <laughs> so I phoned the you do it, watch it <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I phoned the head of emergency <laughs> services and I said, Look, we've got this puff adder. He said, Well look, I'm looking at the screen in front of me, there's an ambulance coming out to you now to collect the mother and the newborn. I said, Yes. He said, Well just put the puff adder in a bucket and then put it in the front of the ambulance and they can bring everything in. Well, I tell you what, when the ambulance driver arrived, <laughs> he had the paramedic with him and she was busily loading mother and child into the back of the ambulance. And they were all settled, and we duly brought the bucket. And she looked at the bucket, and I think it must be a, sort of an instinct that said, what's in the bucket? Well, she we thought said, it was the afterbirth, which <laughs> we have to send. <laughs> okay. okay. It wasn't. It was the puff adder. Oh, well, she jumped. <laughs> she climbed straight out without touching any of the steps in the ambulance. <laughs> and she said she is not traveling in an ambulance with a snake. Anyway, we eventually decided, okay, she'll sit at the back with the patients, yes. with, or the mother and newborn. And we put the snake in front on the floor next to the driver. He was also sort of yeah, right out of the window. And type Gabby at the back. I think what he's telling you is that... Uh, <laughs> there are funny we, moments. That, well, a lot. Yeah. I mean, we laugh at each other. 
And there you can't, the thing about the village is that when you step onto the village, it doesn't, you, there's no veneer. Mm. And this is what really catches people out mm. because they arrive with their titles mm. and mm. there's no title. Yeah. Because you have to present yourself as you really yeah, are. As a human. And you, you're not really used to doing that anymore. Yeah, that's true. That is true. People live behind their titles and where they live and their education. Yeah. And suddenly mm -hmm. they in front of the children and you have to present yourself for who you really are. Yeah, you, behind the kids, you, you can't not be yourself. They see through oh, everything. Oh, yes. Yeah. And then, yeah. yeah. But I think the biggest challenge, of course, is that you come face to face with yourself. Because that's one thing that the village does. It strips you absolutely naked, where you've got to face yourself. Mm. And there is just no place to hide, nothing. Mm. And for me, it was one of the most painful experiences. I'm still trying to come to terms with it. I think because he, he really works on his veneer. I mean, he comes from the northern suburbs, of course. <laughs> <laughs> In Johannesburg, so veneer counts. Yeah. Well, veneer was everything. <laughs> True. We, we just want to touch on, because obviously you guys deal on a daily basis with HIV and AIDS. Mm. Um, Talani, you want to? Yeah, so I'm going to hold up to you. There's this book, HIV and AIDS, um, by Marina Coleman. And the cartoonist, Sofiso Yellow. And I actually met her at the, at the Feather Award. She won an award for the work she's doing okay. um, with, with this book. And basically, it's, a, it's your, your complete guide and resource. It's got lots and lots of information in it and we just thought because AIDS is a, a huge part of your day-to-day -day life it's a huge part of of the rural Africa and just trying to I think Marina's um what's her, her mission is to try and get the book out and to educate as many people as possible she, mm. by educating hopefully we'll, we'll slow down the, the spread of AIDS and yeah so um it is a very useful resource for anyone listening that, that wants to, to get some information to their, their companies or their organization, their community, their schools. And you were saying that it's, it's, you feel it's not quite appropriate for... Well, I think it's very schools. appropriate. It's very beautiful, beautifully presented. And the cartoon effect is very good mm. because we have to put a bit of lightness in such a terrifying subject. Mm. And, you know, of course, it's everybody's business now. Yeah. Um, even though we believe it's only in the rural areas and poor people, and especially black. Yeah. So, um, and my kids always laugh uh, when uh, people rush up and try and take out some people that we know in the village that are very, very highly infected. And they say it's not possible because they're too beautifully dressed and they look good. Yeah. So what I'm saying, the book is excellent for education for, for people that are educated yes. and for kids that are savvy. But, you know, poverty takes savvy away from you. Okay. Yeah. So when I looked at some of the things, um, some of the examples, we just learn from experience. Yes. Um, what, what makes, when I have children sitting in front of me, not children, youth, and saying, but if she's pregnant, that means that you slept with her without a condom. And they say, yeah. And I say, D you, you're not scared? And they say, no, because of this and that and that. And I think what I find, this is perfect to start with, Mm. And then they should take out some sections and, and write for men okay. and youth. Yes. And then mm. for girls, uh, a lot of girls that are being sexually abused in homes and yeah. they need to know about it. So what I'm saying, it is excellent um, uh, a place to start, yeah. platform. Mm. But if they're going to get to the kids where it is, and I hear the horrendous numbers in our schools um, that aren't even being discussed anymore because they're too terrifying to discuss, mm. okay. that most of the classes are going to be empty. Wow. Um, so it is a good, and I think it's a wonderful book, and I think people should get it. And I think that every parent should have it in yeah. there. And especially young youth in privileged environment, they should have a book like this in every house. Mm -hmm. And people yes. should know about it. And it shouldn't be, um, it shouldn't be voluntary reading. It should be compulsory Can reading for right. anyone young. Mm. Because anything to do with sex, and everybody's involved. Mm. And we have yes. to be honest about what's happening with our youth. Yeah. And our kids are all sexually active. And I know every mother out there trembles, but it's the truth. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things that we all might want to deny, but it's happening and we need to face it's, it. It's and we have to face it. We really do. So if anyone is listening that wants to get hold of, hold of the book, you just go to marinacoleman.com. All the details there on how you can actually order the book and you can get hard copies for 15 Rand and electronic downloads. For two dollars ninety-five. Now you guys had a. There was a documentary done on you guys called "Angels in the Dust." 
That's right, yeah. Um, mm. About, was it five years ago? 2007, four 2007, years ago. Four years ago. It was released in 2007. Okay. Um, and I think that there's a lot of focus in there also on the AIDS subject as well. Yeah. And also, obviously, a lot on how you guys operate and, and what you guys are about, uh, which is, the, which is I, how I got introduced to you guys and uh, I've spread the word to other people about mm. you guys. Um, so for anybody out there who wants to know more about Bocciabello and what they do, um, if you look at this, and you can go out and actually get the DVD, and you can actually get the DVD from Bocciabello themselves uh, for about 100 bucks. Um, have a look at the trailer that uh, we just had on the screen. Go to the website um, and get to know what these guys are really about and what we're talking about here. It really gives you an insight to to their daily lives. Yeah, so it's just for the website is bocciabello.org. Which .org, is yeah. B-O-T-S-C-H-A-B-E-L-L. Can't. There it is. And I've started the blog. I mean, people have been asking me to do the blog, and I'm starting to write what happens day to day. So that also gives people an idea what's going on in the village. What's going on? Which we take for granted. So I'm trying to... There it is. I'm trying to get past that and the strange things that happen to us. We'll be putting on, sorry, Marion, we'll be putting on the purchase details on the blog. The purchase details, yeah. yes. Yeah. Anyone wants to purchase the um, Angels in the Dust Correct. documentary? Correct. Yeah. Not, not from the Angels in the Dust website. Yeah. And it's not just about us. I think everybody out there, just to uh, our entire ethos, is about being kind. And if you just show kindness to everybody, you can't. You can't fight. Yes, it's like human and currency. Yeah. Just to be great, you know, to be to be gracious and graceful. Yeah. In, in in the face of adversity, when you lose everything, and you don't start blaming the world and God, mm. but just look at it and say, "I'll take it." Mm. To hear that you're dying, and to be gracious about it. Mm. For your parents to say, "I'm not going to. I, I want. I'm not using medicines. I'm going to die," and to be gracious and say, "Fine." So just to be kind and to have gratitude, just by using those two things every day, uh, we never go wrong. Yeah, and would it's hard to be kind all the time. <laughs> would you say that's the one thing that keeps you going? It's the children that wake up in the morning and look at us with hope. Okay. And trust. Children trust even though sometimes we can't trust ourselves all the time because we feel broken. But the trust is there. Mm. And when the children get up and they, they're excited about the day, and I know that they would have been starving, we take them out of a place where they're being raped. All the girls that stand up and they smile and they're excited about a partner and they've come out of a home where they were used for child prostitution and they can look at the world and smile and you know that somehow a spark has been lit. Mm. It's, not, it's not what happens to you. It's really not what happens to you. It's what you decide you're going to do with it. Yeah. And that is how those children have made a, a difference to their lives. Okay. And we've seen the worst. We have seen them. I don't think there's that much more that we could see that we do to each other as human beings. Uh -huh. and, but for those same people to get up shows us it doesn't matter what happens to you. You must have courage and you must take responsibility mm. for your journey. And there's, there's a nice video we found that we thought really speaks to that. It's um, on, on YouTube. It's a short clip of Derek Redman. He was a British record holder for the 400 meter sprints. Mm. And he was in the 92 Barcelona Olympics. And going now, this is uh, the race before the final race or the semi finals, whatever. And he's yeah. sprinting, all of a sudden his hamstring goes and he just falls to the ground. In, in absolute pain, and his his whole life has been around getting to to this point to finish this race. And then what he actually does is he decides now he's going to finish it, and he gets up and he starts limping, and he's limping along. And then his father, who's he's very close to, is is in the audience, pushes past all the security, and that's my son, and and runs onto the field and says to him, "You don't have to do this." And he says, "No, I want to finish this race." Now, meanwhile, the whole race is finished already, and when the the 60,000 people in the audience see it, they get up and they start cheering him. And his father helps him right up to the finish line, then let's, let's go and let's him walk over the finish line. 
And to this day, apparently people don't even know who won the race. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's what people are remembering about this all the way from 92 is that, that human story mm. of the father coming to help his son <laughs> and the son not giving up. So as you say, he's in excruciating pain. I mean, he's lost his whole hamstring and he's, he, he's like, no, I'm going to finish this race. Yeah. And he, he does. So it's, you it's guys a very deal with this on a daily basis on yeah. a different level. Well, I think so. it's so, uh, that is so similar and uh, uh, metaphorical for how we are. There's only one thing I can add to that story is that we found the children that have snapped their hamstrings are normally the ones that pick us up wow. and help us across the line. Wow. Mm. And that's what we found was just wow. That is the wow sure. about being human. Yeah. And if, if people who are feeling depressed about the future and all the things that are happening and the economic crisis in the world, um, just look at the wow in human. Hmm. Don't take the wow out of human. People try and do that, and they can never do that to us. It's what's made us survive as a species yeah. and made us so exceptional. Yeah. And the people that feel that they aren't doing enough, just build your wow. Love that. Yeah. I love that. Do you have anything to add? No, <coughs> just that Quibbles mm. was speaking to me earlier on about what makes us carry on and not give up. Mm. I think just before you gave that example, Marion answered that question beautifully mm. with all the reasons why we can't give up. Mm. Exactly. So, yeah, that's. And we haven't found the recipe, as Khan says. No <laughs> one's taught us how to get up. Yeah. I'm not sure if they've come and teach us, but we, we just don't know anything else but walking forward. Yeah. And once you start going forward in your life, um, and there's so much inequality in the world. It's not just about children. It's not just about our country. We must always fight. Mm. And many people are doing wonderful work. Animals. There's work being done in the animals mm. kingdom. There's work being done for trees. Mm. It's, they are wonderful people out there that have given up everything to do work that's just that little bit extra. Um, and if any, everybody could come and help us with a child, I mean, and an adult, we wouldn't have to do the work we do. Yeah. But until everybody comes to it, we can't give up. Yeah. And essentially, I think, well, just to point out what you're saying, people... people that are doing the work, they're giving up. They're giving up materialism in a way. So how I see it, they're giving up living in suburbia, having the big house, the big car, the... the your own mm, toilet. Your own toilet. <laughs> so, yeah, they're giving up that, that comfort, <laughs> you know, yeah. that, that... And what they're finding is, and what, what I'm hearing from your story, is, is more that, that humanness. There's people that have... And humanness is rich. It's, and it's, so yeah. It's, Once you taste it. it they're wealthier. I suppose. Yeah. Oh, you yes. guys are very wealthy. We are extremely wealthy. In fact, we are billionaires. Um, we don't eat that well. But um, our spirits are just, um, just wonderful. And it's from people just coming and smiling and saying thank you. And we don't ever expect gratitude. Our gratitude is when we see them looking at the future and smiling. Or being able to go on, on um, Easter and cleaning their parents' graves and saying to people with pride, this is my mom. Mm. And people go, okay. Because what do you say to a child who shows you where their mom is in the ground? And they say, this is my mom and, and I've got to look after her grave and I've got to walk for my mom. And then you know it's just it's special, yeah. and it's it's very special. So I think what I'm taking away then from your talk is 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 understanding that human currency, as you've called it, yeah. but also the living in the moment, the the really savoring whether it's a painful moment or a joyful. If it's living in, in the moment, not being so concerned about the future, but living now and doing what needs to be done now. Absolutely, and that has is been our motto: do what's put before you. Yeah. Nothing more, nothing less. And. and and understand the impact you have on all the, or as you're saying, the, the trust that those children have, you know, look at you every day, that is what keeps you going. Absolutely. So it's, it's finding whatever that is, that human currency is, I think, what, what often keeps a lot of people persevering. Mm. It's understanding that. Well, I think if we saw each other as currency, because Bochabella has reached a point now where we've become so big that we need people out there 
to bring whatever little bit of help they can, whether it be their skills, whether it be their knowledge, whether mm. it be their time, whether it be a small amount of finance. We need everything we can get yeah. because we're dealing in human currency. Mm. And a lot of people tell us we'd love to help, but we don't know how. It's very simple. Just find the nearest charity and go and bail in and help mm. because there are not enough people doing it. Yeah. It's social entrepreneurship. It's social. Well, okay, we've now really coined a new is. phrase I for mean, it. I they've but coined <laughs> that <laughs> yes. um, yeah. as social entrepreneurs to become social entrepreneurs. I think just before we wrap it up here, yeah, um, I just wanted to mention one thing where people um, who are close can get involved. This Sunday, there's actually a bit of a celebration party um, happening um, at Bochabella where we've got a bunch of students coming in from overseas and we're going to give the kids quite a nice time. There's going to be some jumping castles and all sorts of stuff. So if you guys want to find out more about that, you're welcome to... Uh, contact Bochabello on their on their um, details or us on, at Let's Talk Possibility, and we'll give you yeah. more details about how to get involved and what you can do to be part of it. And I think for for privileged people to allow their children to mix with poor children, and you can't catch AIDS by smiling yeah. and touching, <laughs> and uh, and and understand that your children are South African and that they should um, embrace people from all. Um, areas and and economic groups yeah. because they are going to be there when we're all gone yeah. and if they can't speak to each other now when are they going to speak to each yeah. other so they mm -hmm. must be helped with their parents to speak to each other as equals mm -hmm. um, in this human pond where we're all living and I'm just sorry to interrupt yes. you before we do yes. wrap um, on the 10th of July we celebrated our 21st birthday ah. mm -hmm. and Correct. I'll tell you what we, the things that we've got mapped out for the future that's one thing that we've learned not to do is you can never pre-plan anything because your day goes one way yeah. but with the ideas that we're sitting with at the moment and for I development is the love of my life and we have developed a tremendous amount over the 21 years and we've had a rebirth again this morning well it's also knowledge and how to go forward okay. because our children have grown up mm. not that my house is not full of babies again, <laughs> <laughs> but nonetheless. But it is interesting, obviously, with the growth comes and the generation. Comes absolutely, and planning for the generation. future because we can afford to plan. And we experienced. Mm -hmm. well, we know absolutely. what huge mistakes we've made. But we're as proud of our failures as our, our successes. And you keep going. So oh, yeah, thank you so much for persevering. Yeah, and thank you really really very much for inviting us. We really thank you very much. Here. Um, we'll, yeah. we'll have you guys. We'll sure. be back at some stage. We'll talk some more about <laughs> it. Um, we'll definitely see you on Sunday. Thank uh, you. We'll be there. Wonderful. Yeah, we we'll look forward to it. Our next show is on Monday, the 5th of September. So we look forward to having you guys listen in there. And tomorrow is the Let's Talk Sports, Sports yes. show. That's on tomorrow night. So you can log into that and, and see you going. And, yeah, we really hope that, that you are inspired and just won't give up your persevere in your lives. Yes. And and take yeah, have you taken something from, from the our show discussion? Tonight. I definitely have. So yes, once again, thank you guys. And thank, you. Thank, you. thank you very much for having us. We'll see you again. See you in the next show. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Cheers.